Welcome back to the video lecture series for Introduction to the Art of Programming Using Scala. Uh, we continue our look at recursion, and in the last uh, video we basically introduced the fundamental idea of recursion and showed how recursion could get us to repeat code multiple times. Uh, and of course the whole idea of recursion is that you have a function and that function calls itself. And so having the function call itself makes the activity happen again and again and again and we saw that we need something called a base case, which is the situation under which it doesn't call itself. Other, otherwise, we get infinite recursion where it keeps calling itself forever. Um, so in this video, I want to actually use recursion to calculate something for us instead of just printing it out. As we saw in a previous video, there is a fundamental difference between calculating something for you and giving you back that value versus printing something and the the calculating is fundamentally more powerful because it allows you to do something else with it whereas if you just print stuff it goes to the user which at some level is is important but it's not useful to the rest of your program so to start off here I'm going to use one of my favorite examples for uh, something a calculation we can do using recursion and that is the factorial Now, you might remember factorial from a math class. It's written uh, with a, an exclamation point. Okay, so 6 factorial is defined as 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And in general, a, the factorial of a number is the product of uh, all of the numbers less than it uh, down to, to 1. Okay, so, so that's the definition that we have and just like what we had in the previous video where we were either counting down or wanted to do something a certain number of times you can hopefully see that there is a, a parallel here where I need to do something with the 6 and the 5 and the 4 now if you were writing this in a math notation you might there's a most people are familiar with the a large sigma to mean summation fewer people are familiar with the fact that a large pi means a, a product but if you were writing this in a math class, you'd typically use that large pi, or you might do, you know, something like um, this for so n factorial is n times n minus one times n minus two times dot dot dot. Okay, for and then magic happens and it comes down to here. Um, works very well for a math class. Doesn't work for a program. Okay, and so. So we want to have a definition that we can use that doesn't have this magical dot 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 in it. And one way of doing that is to note, just like when we're talking about counting down, if I want to count down from 10, I print 10. And then after I print down, uh, I have to, after I print the 10, what do I have left to do? Instead of thinking of it as I just now print 9, think of it as now I need to do a countdown that starts at 9. And the countdown that starts at 9 says 9. And then it goes and it has what, what's left to do, a countdown that starts at 8. So if we think about factorial in that same way, what is n factorial? Well, n factorial is equal to n times, well, what is the rest of this over here? Well, that is simply n minus 1 factorial. And you would want to do that continually until you get down to 1. So if n is greater than 1, it's this, else it's 1. Okay. So this is a nice mathematically sound definition, and this converts very nicely into a program. So what I want to do is I want to write this right here in Scala. I will have to delete all of this above. Actually, let's put it inside of a comment so that it can stay there def factorial of n, which is an integer, is going to give us back an integer, and it should be equal to if n is greater than 1, it is n times the factorial of n minus 1, else it is 1. Okay. 
let's go ahead and read in a value here and then I can say print something out for it. Let's see if we've typed that all properly. Enter a number. Um, five. I like five because I happen to easily remember that its factorial is 120. Okay, because five times four times three times two times one is 120. Okay, so this works. This is a, a nice recursive definition. One thing to note here, remember when we were talking about functions initially, I said that you, in general, you are not required to provide a return type, but you probably should. It turns out that recursive functions are the one exception to that. When you write a recursive function, you have to provide the return type. And now you might wonder, well, why you didn't return, provide a return type in the previous version? Let's go look at what we did in countdown you might be tempted to say, well, you didn't give a return type here. Remember, when you don't put an equal sign or a return type, that is implicitly saying unit equals. Okay, so the syntax that I used is shorthand for saying it returns unit, so I did specify a return type, and that's why it was okay to be a recursive function. Here, with the int, I have to specifically say that it's returning an int. And the reason that Scala forces me to do this is because I'm using the function over here, and in order to be able to check whether or not this works, it has to know what the return type is going to be. So, so that's why Scala forces you to put a return type on a recursive function. Now, just because it's kind of fun to do, uh, let's look at factorials for some other values. So we looked at five. 10 factorial, um, 15 factorial, 20 factorial, oh, okay. Now, we've gone over before what happens if numbers start getting too big. Your int has a limit on it, and that limit is uh, on the order of 2 billion. Um, and so it turns out that 15 factorial is about as far as you can go if you're using an int. Well, what if I wanted to take some larger factorials? What could I do? Well, the answer to that is don't use an int. Use, as the first option, a long. Okay. So remember the long type is just like the int type, but it has twice as many bits. So instead of being a 32-bit number, it's a 64-bit number, which means that it can represent significantly larger values. So once again, it has actually, so as you can see, the 15 factorial was not correct here either. It's just, it's not immediately obvious. Um, if you run it again, 20 factorial, perfectly happy. If you run it again, 30 factorial, that breaks down as well. Now, there actually is a type that you can use here. Instead of using long or int, there is a type that is built into Scala called big int. Now, the thing about big int is it can do arbitrary it can represent arbitrarily large numbers. And so that's really cool and fun when you're if you're going to be playing with large numbers. If, if you happen to have a you know some type of a of an interest in the math and just seeing some of these things, I have to admit it is kind of cool to see just how big something like a hundred factorial is or a thousand factorial. Okay, these are some really large numbers in that they take more than a screen to print out, and the big int will calculate them just fine for you. Uh, it has no problem storing them. The, um, the reason why we don't use big int all the time, that's the standard question that students ask me. They, well, why do we use regular int? Why don't we use big int all the time? Big int is far slower than a regular int. And the reason for that is because your computer actually has built into it, um, you know, is hardwired 32-bit int integers. So it is set up to do fast math with those 32 int in integers. You probably also have wiring to set up to do fast math with 64-bit integers. So int and long are kind of built into the computer and they are fast. 
Big Int is not. Okay, Big Int is running a whole bunch of code behind it. There is, it is not built into the hardware of the computer. And for that reason, anytime that you use Big Int, you are going to lose a lot of speed. So you really should only use the Big Int when you have a problem where you need to actually use that that big end and you actually need all the digits otherwise this would have worked fine with a double it's just it would have been, been imprecise so this is factorial okay um like i said i like this example i think it's a a nice example of how we can take a mathematical definition and turn it into a recursive definition and then build scala code off of that there was another example that we did in a previous chapter uh, it was actually under the conditionals chapter, where we were looking at averaging grades. And when we did that, we asked the user for a, a sum of all the grades, as well as how many grades there were. And that is kind of, it's, it's a less than ideal approach, um, simply because humans adding up grades, we're not really good at it. That's the type of thing we want the computer to do for us. And indeed, uh, that's how we should write our program to do things. So how could we do that? Okay, if, if I wanted to have a script that said, how many grades do you have? And they were going to uh, num grades equals read int. And then I would want to do some magical call here. Uh, sum grades equals read and sum num grades. And then print line the average is and say some grades dot two double divided by num grades. The two double is because I'm expecting these will be ints and remember your for your grades you probably don't want to truncate off the fractional part. So I'll do a conversion to a double. So I want a function here called read and sum. Remember this is what uh, this is an example kind of a of a top down design where I just I, I write this code here for my script assuming that this exists and then I have to make it exist so this is kind of my top level problem and now I need I've broken it into something smaller now I have to write that something smaller so I want a function and clearly here because I'm passing in num grades I'm passing in an int so in the function, I'll just say it's it's in for how many things I want to to read and sum up. And what's it supposed to return to me? Well, I've kind of implied that I'm going to read in a bunch of integer grades. And if I read in a bunch of integer grades, their sum will be also be an integer. So what should happen inside of here? Well, and if they typed in five, I need to write read in five grades. If they typed in 10, I need to read in 10 grades. That is one way to think about it but it's not the right way to think about it when we're approaching this problem recursively. The idea is, if we're going to do it recursively, if I want to read in five grades, I read in one grade, and the sum of the grades is going to be that one plus the sum of all the rest of them. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, oops, hit caps lock, print line, enter a grade, val grade equals read int. And what am I supposed to give you back? Well, I'm supposed to give you back that grade plus the sum of all the rest. Read and sum. But I've already read one, so now I don't need n more. I just need n minus 1 more. Okay. And you should look at this and uh, Hopefully, for at least some people watching this video, a little buzzer goes off and they're saying, whoa, whoa, we're missing something. This is a recursive function and it always calls itself. There's no if in here, there's no conditional, and that's a problem. So yes, we need a base case. When should we stop? Well, do I need to ask them to enter a grade if the n was zero? Answer is, of course, no. 
So I'm going to put an if here. If n is less than 1, so if we were supposed to enter fewer than 1 grades, give you back 0. The sum of fewer than 1 grades is 0. Else, and I'll put some curly braces in here. And there you go. Okay. So now we have a base case. The base case has a return value of 0. It happens when n is less than 1. Otherwise, we ask them for the grade. And we are going to give back that grade plus the sum of whatever's left over. Let's see if we type that in properly. How many grades do I have? I'll go with 5. 99, 78, 93, 85, 62. Okay. Uh, and there is our average. Going back to the rule of you should do something where you know the answer. Well, if I have five grades, and I you know, make them consecutive, the average winds up being the one in the middle. Um, and of course, we could actually do a test on this to make sure that that, that was correct as well. Uh, so it's good to verify that the code works. Um, but here you can see another use of recursion to actually calculate something for us. And the nice thing about this is, though I don't want to have to do it, I could say enter 500 grades, and this code would do it. This code works equally well for you know, five grades as it does for 500 grades uh, without us changing anything in here because we get the repetition of the function calling itself. The other thing to note both here and in countdown and in factorial is this. We're passing in an n minus 1. Maybe you've already noticed that that seems to be a theme. Not all recursive functions are going to do that. But what you pass in has to be something that takes you toward the base case. Okay, So if you, if you call it and what you call doesn't move you towards the base case, then you're going to have infinite recursion because you're just going to keep going and going and going and never actually get to the base case. Here, my base case is small values. It's n less than 1. In countdown, it was the same type of thing, small values. In the uh, factorial, it was also small values. Because all of those were going toward 0, basically, I was always calling this with n minus 1. You can make recursion where this would be an n plus 1, and then this would be some maximum level. Uh, and of course, recursion can happen in a lot of other different ways. But the thing to keep in mind is that what you pass into the recursive of the call needs to somehow move you a step closer to your base case. Because if it doesn't move you closer to your base case, uh, to your base case, then you're going to run into infinite recursion. So that's it for this video, and we'll come back next time and look at how we could make this more general.